Ako tau nei te ruru kau kau mai nei ki hai ma hiti ki hai ma raka raka tu poki nui o te ruru te re ko he po he po he au ka wa ti ti ai wa mau di ora nei ra te mihi ki au kuto ku rau i te mai te nei ra ka huri taku aro ki a rata ko ia ki te po mai mai ra mai mai ra o ki o ki mai e nei wa ka huri taku aro ki mai ka tere e te kapo pauri ki runga ra e tangi hotu hotu te whenua nei mo June. Mere Titawa Kemp, te tai uri o te whānau te aika, te whānau gweno e nei wā, kua hea tu ki te pō moi mai rā e te taua moi mai, moi mai oki oki mai. Kaori mātou i wariwari tia, ia koe haere, haere, haere atu rā ki a tau, ki a tau, ki a tau. Rātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou, nō reira tēnā koutou, nei mahara mai ki tēnei hui o te wai me te penua, o tēnei komiti, te kauni era tai o ki waitā, nō reira huri noa, huri noa. Tēnā kūtou, tēnā kūtou, tēnā tātou katoa. Welcome to the Water and Land Committee. Also, I'd like to acknowledge those online, especially Ted Howard from Kaikoura CWMS and also Erin Harvey from the Waimakariri Zone Committee. I know others will be coming online closer to the meeting. And also today we'll have the, we'll have Ross Millichamp, Stephen McNally and Mike Hickford coming along to uh, for, regarding uh, the Fresh Green Working Group. Um, otherwise, I'd like to yeah, open the meeting uh, today and welcome once again. Tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā tatou katoa. We have apologies. Um, uh, Chair Scott, uh, Councillor Pauling, uh, Councillor McKenzie and Councillor uh, Sunknell um, are on council business with uh, Salwan District Council. Also, we have Councillor Dicie on online. Um, and I'll also note that we have a quorum um, here today. Uh, there are, as I know, there is no conflict of interest. No, uh, there are no public forums or deputations or petitions to be presented today. Um, is there any ex extraordinary, extraordinary or urgent business today? Oh, and there are no notices of motion. Therefore, move into uh, section 7, 7.1 for the minutes. Uh, the minutes of the previous meeting are on page eight of your agenda. Uh, are there any matters of urgency relating to the minutes? Oh, otherwise, we'll have uh, we'll move we'll move the minutes and uh, councillor seconder, councillor Ward. Got those? Oh, we're going to have that on. We're going to have that on. Uh, therefore, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Uh, against? None. Gary. Order. Uh, moving on to eight, uh, section eight report items, 8.1. We have the land and um, the water and land committee resolution status report, and I'll call um, Dr. Davies. Yeah, David, please. Dr. Davies, please. Uh, Dr. Davies, please. Uh, Kia ora, Chair, and um, just just working through as you be with the, um, in, the items that are marked in green are complete. Um, and just just particularly wanted to note under the very first one there, which was the public forum from Jessica Holsey and Kelly McMurtry, that um, they have been written to, but also there have been several staff meetings where staff have been liaising with them about the work that they are doing in that catchment um, coordinator role. So that's been that's an ongoing piece of work. Um, just moving through onto the ones that are marked as orange, and so on page 21, there is the drinking water nitrate testing, the um, the the campaign that, that um, particularly in social media, but also advertisement campaign around private drinking wells. It, although it says it's ended on the 25th of August, that's the formal ending. It is still continuing, and I do know that I saw something on Facebook just yesterday I think so it is actually continuing on for a little bit longer but that is that um, has been completed the second part which is um, requesting staff to talk to territorial authorities to mana order and zone committees we have written to all of those and we're just following up on um, what the responses are so we'll be reporting back on that soon. Um, and then the uh, the 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 one that is on the following page on page twenty two 
which talks about the improved construction industry compliance around sediment in particular. So under 5.1, improved construction industry compliance with erosion sediment control matters. I've got a report here that recent erosion and sediment control training have been well attended by industry, and we will continue to offer training to industry to improve the understanding around uh, erosion and sediment control. We're also working with Christchurch City Council to address sediment from construction, and there have been a number of incidents for poor practice that have been raised with the City Council, and they've been followed up on, these have been followed up on by the City Council in improvement and practice, and we continue to look for improvements uh, with CCC processes to improve management of the construction industry. So it's, it is ongoing, and there have been several proactive steps taken, particularly around the training. Um, and then under uh, the final item on page 23 of the agenda, the uh, endorsement around the funding. Um, the endorsement for the utilisation of the action plan budget. Uh, um, so, we, sorry, we have received endorsement from Hurunui District Council and from Tarunanga or Kaikoura. Uh, a response has not been received from uh, Nai Tuahiri Runaka um, or Mahananui Kurataya Limited on behalf of the Runaka regarding this proposal. Consequently, what we have done is to focus the Braided River Birds flagship program on the Waiau Ufa um, River in 2022-23, given that this hour is within the rohi of Kaikoura Runaka. This approach doesn't lessen the project's implementation and has been conveyed to the project partners, such as the Department of Conservation, who are supportive of this approach for the 2023 Braided River um, birds nesting season. And we will be continuing to uh, to inquire with uh, Nai Tuahaviri um, through MKT Mahanui Kuratai Limited into the future. Councillor Kurako. Uh, kia ora, Tim. Uh, just a, a point of clarification. So, um, and I'm talking about uh, the uh, the endorsement. So you've got endorsement from the Hurunui District Council and Tarunang or Kaikoura. So does that only? So does this? Does this here actually? Um, is is it situated on? Both sides of the Hurunui River, the southern and the north, or is it just the northern side? Um, the project itself you're referring to, so the project was uh, in the Hurunui and in the Waiaufa. And what we're doing is we're concentrating the work in the Waiaufa, not in the Hurunui. The reason for that is because That's correct. Okay. Yes. Um, any uh, any questions, clarifications um, for Tim? Oh. Good. Further to that question, just the clarity around that, uh, there was a fifty thousand dollar budget uh, line for the twenty three year. I hear that it's been put into the wire UFA. And if you're having ongoing discussions, have we allocated the whole lot, or is there still has there been some funds set aside? I believe I'm just looking to my colleague at the back. Perhaps Murray, you could just come to the table. But I believe the whole lot has been assigned. Just I've just checked that with Murray Griffin. Yes, that's correct. Yes, we. Um, as uh, the committee may recall, we um, have followed through with the, the pattern from the previous financial year as well and, and allocated the full 50k um, for this project. Supplementary through you, Chair. Um, so then I'm just asking, does that mean that this recommendation is complete? And that any ongoing discussions with no to a Hulili would be for a following year. Is that the feeling that I'm getting? That is correct. 
just a point of clarification again. You just said, so we're talking the 50,000 is actually, that's the full use of that funding. Okay. Any other parts of it? Councillor Kuraku? Happy with that. Uh, anything else for that's Tim Davey on that one? Otherwise, I'll yep, ask Tim to step away. Um, firstly, I'll, I'll put the motion and then it'll be opportunity for discussion. The recommendation is on page 16. Um, and that is uh, notes the status of the previous resolutions provided in the status of Water and Land Committee Resolutions Report, August 2023. It's up on the screen now. Do I have a mover? Councillor Mackay, seconder. Councillor East. Um, any discussion? None. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Uh, it's against. None. Carried. Gilda. Uh, moving on to 8.2, um, the Northern Zone Committees. Can we please ask um, Murray to come to the table? We also have um online i think we have ted ted how, how ted can you please turn on your microphone and camera please greetings i hope you can hear me Kia ora, ted. Kia ora, ted. i'll just hand over to murray um, to introduce the the, the paper please Kia ora. Uh, thank you chair and to councillors um uh, it's my pleasure to present this northern zone committee or cwms uh, report it follows on from the um, the southern report we did at the previous water and land committee and preceding that the central zone. So the format is is re reasonably consistent with those earlier reports in terms of with a particular focus on the action plan budget that's been expended uh, in the 22-23 financial year. We've also got some reference to a couple of projects that have, have been supported in the current financial year as well as the committees have moved forward with their action plan. Um, development and, and implementation. Um, delighted to uh, have uh, Ted as the chair online and just noting, I think, uh, my colleague jo Jody Hoggard, who's in the last few months joined the facilitation team in Kaikoura. So uh, we were delighted to have uh, Jody join the team given uh, her uh, connectedness within the Kaikoura community. And uh, for some of you may be aware, Jody did a sterling job of leading the Plains Recovery Project over three years following the earthquake. So um, delighted to have Jody on board. We've also got Erin Harvey as the Deputy Chair of Waimakariri, and uh, hopefully Caroline Latham is online as well as the Chair, so I can defer to them. And just also to note uh, two apologies uh, from Mia Mari Black uh, from the Hurunui, and also from Judith Batchelor, who's the, the Chief Strategy uh, and community officer at HDC who are both apologies today, so they were unable to attend. Uh, I can probably hand it back to the chair perhaps to introduce the, and uh, the probably Ted have been online, he can pick things off, but um, but yeah, I guess we can take the report as read and I can be available to answer any follow-up questions as we go through. Good on, Murray. Yeah, good on, Ted. Please take read, uh, the, the paper as read and uh, highlights um, from, from the zone. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora. Um, thanks for this opportunity. Um, yeah, like what we're doing up here is basically continuing our coalition of the willing approach. Um, yeah, there's still so much stress in the community post-quake. We still haven't come out of the peak of of that um, social disruption curve. Um, and now this year they've been throwing the like all of our rural industries have reduced payouts. So it's very definitely a matter of uh, finding those willing and working with them. So the team here in Kaikoura have been doing a great job at that. And Murray's excellent report here, I think, quite adequately demonstrates it. The only thing the report doesn't explicitly talk about, which I'd like to continue focusing on, is our continuation of Bill Bayfield's work on, with the conference on the Clarence. Uh, with our focus on the Waiatoa, and we have a, it's not an official meeting, it's a workshop um, up at Clarence uh, next month on this process. So it's just trying to coordinate all the different groups that are there so that we can get the best bang for the limited bucks that are available. Yeah, any questions? I'm happy to respond. 
Sure, Ted, thanks for that. Um, any questions? Councillor Burns. Uh, kia ora. Uh, kia ora to everyone online, um, especially the ones I know. Uh, I just have a question more for Murray if he uh, is available to answer. Um, can I acknowledge in my question while I'm waiting for Murray to come up the, the fantastic work that uh, the Zone Committee, Waimakariri and uh, Kaikaira do? Um, Murray, my question is through the report, there is um, for both Waimakariri and for Kaikaira, the um, total funding is observed, um, $75,000. Is there a breakdown available for all of the projects identified and how much they actually received? Kia ora and through the chair, um, I, I can list through um, both committees' projects now if you, if you like, just to answer that query. So um, starting on page uh, 27, in terms of the Hapoku Catchment Collective Initiative Year 2, that was a $35,000 uh, commitment from the committee. Um, the next project that's listed in terms of the Wetland and Riparian Restoration Project support was 8585 uh, the Waiatoa Clarence River Rafting Trapping Project was 4,415. So that was the full 50,000 from the previous financial year. The committee has is, is maintained some focus in terms of, of, that, of that mahi and, and have then made decisions around the 23-24 the financial year um, projects as well. So as you'll see, the Hapuku Catchment Collective Year 3 is a $30,000 investment. The Waiatoa Hapua Protection is a $25,000 commitment. And uh, Waikoua Beach Cleanup Sea Week Community Event is a $1,500 investment. And for the Waimakariri Committee, through, which is moving through to page 34 of the report, the um, for the 2022-23 projects, the um, the nesting area weed clearing from the, uh, by the Ashi Rakahui River Care Group is five thousand dollars. The the Saltwater Creek Restoration Wetland Restoration Project um, is a fifteen thousand six hundred dollar investment. The water quality gap analysis being led by the Wamakari Land Care Trust is twenty six thousand four hundred. Uh, the environmental awards being set up by the committee's um, uh, biodiversity working group uh, in conjunction with the district council is a $3,000 project. And the, the one project that they have committed to from this financial year is the Rakahuri Estuary Shorebird Monitoring Project, again by the Rakahuri River Care Group. Follows on from what they did in 21-22, and it's a $9,000 project. Kia ora, Murray. Thank you for that uh, supplementary there, Councillor. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, brilliant. Um, and can I just make a suggestion that if they're added to the next report, it's probably a lot easier for you to have to read them all out. Thank you. And again, I just want to acknowledge all of the work gone into those projects. Uh, kia ora, Councillor Burns. Councillor Korako. Uh, can I just first of all, kia ora to you, uh, Ted, uh, no here. I just want to acknowledge um, in your report your first youth representative, uh, Maya Kahu. Um, so I think um, that is sort of kind of reflective of, um, you know, the uh, involvement of our rangatahi youth actually in um, these kinds of uh, forums. That's the first thing. Also, um, I just acknowledge too Vic Manawatu, who passed actually um, last week. Um, the other one, coming back to um, our, um, our staff member here, um, the projects that are taking place in Kaikoda, um, and you went through and kind of the budgets for them. How many of those projects are actually using um, uh, funds, you know, to actually pay for staff to actually carry out those projects? How many are, are funded, you know, through private? Is it private? Is it PCAN staff to, to actually be doing these projects? 
Other reading. Kira, just to answer that query through the chair, the, the budget's not going to staff time. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, Heath Melville and Kaikara doing some great work and I guess overseeing and supporting the community, particularly around the Harpaku Catchment Collective to form. So that's a, I guess over the last two and into year three now, uh, a, a formative catchment group and collective that's being supported through this action plan budget, but it, the, the budget itself's not being utilised by, by ECAN staff at all. It's being overseen as part of East time. Um, take away the ECAN staff, but is there any other um, kind of uh, uh, companies that are actually contributing or, or being funded, used as a funding being used? So probably my question is, one, um, is all the services for these projects, are they core hard? Or is actually some of it being um, used through funding? Because I'm leading to the question is that if um, you know there are kind of private contractors that are actually doing some of this work, is to do Nung or Kaikoda, um, are they actually part of the contractors? Uh, through the chair, the, the, there are contractors being used. So I guess to clarify, a lot of the work that's gone on initially is weed clearance and, and that within that, which has been identified by the um, landowners that are, uh, I guess, forming that collective. And, and so, yeah, this contract work is being uh, utilised uh, over the, the three years. I know that uh, Heath is working pretty closely with Clinton in terms of a different, whether... Uh, uh, Kaikara Runanga are directly one of the con contractors. I'm not entirely sure, but I know that they are, are certainly involved in um, and overseeing uh, what sort of projects are being done up in Kaikara and working quite closely with, with Keith on that. But uh, but contract work is, is a, a big focus of, of the project over the, the, the formation over, over the last two or three years. Final, um, so this is more around um, a response to that. Um, I'm not sure whether you're aware that Terunung or Kaikoda has actually uh, engaged directly with our organisation, with ECAN, actually to highlight the fact is that they have skilled workers within the Runanga, which were part of the Jobs for Nature, um, and they want to, and this actually went on about, this started about over six months ago. So we need to profile the fact if you're using private contractors, it may not be your call, but at least the fact is, if it is, and if it isn't, there's some area of influence that um, that there is put firmly in front of people to say there are rangatahi uh, from Kaikoda, from Terunang or Kaikoda that actually um, you know are available to do that work. Kia ora. Through you, Chair, J just to highlight, uh, thank you for that, and we'll, we will make sure that those opportunities are available. We do have very strict procurement processes that require us to, to go through, um, but we will make sure that, that that is available as an opportunity. Just as a, as a response, I understand about our procurement um, uh, structure, and that was being discussed six months ago as well, is that we actually, through our own procurement, um, and we, we were given, that, that's kind of the default position, uh, when we bring this kind of thing to the uh, to the table, but they were working through that actually to try and kind of find a way through around these kinds of groups within the Runanga being qualifying under the procurement. All right, I was clear. Kia ora, Councillor Koraka, that'll um, Tim, Tim will take that away, but also it's a question for the CEO Stephanie. Um, thank you, uh, Murray. Just um, Ted, while you're, while you're there, you talked about the Waio Toa um, and just uh, some work coming up. So is that different to the what's in the paper regarding the trapping in the Hapua? Was that was that more of the whole river catchment uh, mahi or is it just focused on the Hapua area? No, it's more of the whole catchment. Uh, there's a meeting up at uh, John Murray's Bullsail Yards next month where we're getting all the landowners and the agencies like uh, Linz is basically running it um, together so that they can plan together and see where 
there are opportunities for maximizing things like helicopter time. So where they so rather yeah, it's a, it's a long way to get a helicopter to go in the back there. So if you can get two or three people doing little bits of work on one helicopter flight, you can save an awful lot of money and get a lot more work done. Is it also, Ted, looking at more of the integrated management of the catchment um, for a longer term plan, having like a catchment group, or et cetera, or is that already in place? Well, it is a de facto catchment group, but it doesn't go under that name. But it, it's the group that Bill set up, basically. Just another question, is any of the runanga involved in that at all, do you know? They're always invited. Um, they don't always come along. Uh, oh, Clint's quite. always invited, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put that into Councillor Kōraku. Yoda, uh, Councillor McKay. Um, Ted Clare here. I just really want to acknowledge your long-standing role as chairing the Stone Committee. Um, I realise it's a very small population base there in Kaikoura, um, but you've got uh, quite an extensive uh, range of um, Stone Committee members are representing a wide um, section of the community there. But I know that you've sat in this role for, I don't actually know how many years, but quite a, quite a number of years now. It's um, scary. I actually looked it up the other day and it's 10 years. Okay, 10 years. So look, um, look I just really want, on behalf of Council and, and certainly myself, um, really, really thank you for your drive and your enthusiasm around, enthusiasm around the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. And the zone committees and all the work that um, this committee does within the Kaiko zone. So thank you. Thank you, Claire. But yeah, we're in a time I see where we've got yeah our economic system needs fundamental reform because the economic incentives are no longer aligned with our survival as a society or as ecosystems. So it's a very very challenging time and. Uh, yeah, getting more so by the day with the advent of AI and its increasing impact. But yeah, it's a it's a role I've been focused on. Yeah, I, I saw this challenge coming 40 years ago, and it's here now. So yeah, we're in it. So yeah, thank you. Um, do you want to Ted, uh, Councillor Edge would like to have your comments. Yeah. Uh, thank. Hi, Ted. Um, yeah, just want to um, express my thanks for your involvement for such a long time. It's a really dedicated um, team of people on the zone committee, and um, it's it's uh, people. Are, there are more projects that people want to do than what we can fund, um, but everyone's really enthusiastic. And I just wanted to pick up on the Hapuka catchment project, which is um, uh, multiple multiple. Uh, ways of uh, improving the environment, working for landowners. Um, it's going to provide um, biosecurity um, control, increased biodiversity, recreational opportunities, and it's potentially connecting the Hapuka River with the township as a as a, a walkway, cycleway kind of thing later on. But And, and it's along the coastal margin. Um, so it's, it's part of this importance of uh, Kaikoura uh, in its um, vision to uh, get on the map as a world heritage uh, destination. So it's uh, all of these little projects are working towards uh, overall environmental improvements. So that's just great. Thank you, Grant. Uh, kia ora, Councillor Edge. Uh, I'd just like to re reiterate the comments from Councillor Mackay there, Ted, just uh, the money that you've done. You said 10 years. So, um, Thank you, thank you for all that. And then I uh, hopefully see you in another ten online. <laughs> but thank, thank you once again, Ted, for your for your report um, and coming online, making time for us uh, this morning, and, and with those comments, Noreda Tenakwe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Right, I'd like to, uh, if um, uh, Caroline and uh, Erin can turn your, um, your microphones and your cameras on, um, and then. And then Good morning. <laughs> Erin, are you are you presenting this morning? Oh. Uh, no, it was just Caroline. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm afraid we don't have. Uh...
prick Indonesia at the back of Sefton. <laughs> I'll cut by Caroline. Um, I will take take your um, your report as read, but um, if there's any highlights or anything you'd like to put forward to the council, um, the time is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so, as noted in the agenda, the the zone committee was very saddened by the recent loss of two past members, in Claire Williams, and they both made significant co contributions to both the committee and the community in their own ways. So, yeah, just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, in terms of what's front of mind, the zone committee was delighted to have seventy five thousand in the action plan fund this year. So, thank you very much for that. Um, we've already allocated 9,000 to monitoring, which was mentioned before, and we are actively looking for um, additional projects. So next Monday, the Zone Committee is going to have a look at a wetland in Fernside, where the landowner is motivated, but they need an ecological assessment and a plan so that they know um, how to protect and enhance it. And we're also looking at potential projects for willow control, riparian plant the possibility of offering seed funding for catchment group startups. And we're also working closely with WDC, ECAN and the Waimakariri Biodiversity Trust to identify projects. So we're quite excited to advise that we've just gone live in the last week calling for applications for the inaugural Waimakariri Zone Environmental Award. It will be a way of acknowledging our environmental champions. And we're really grateful for the huge amount of assistance that we've had from Waimakariri District Council. And the awards are going to be presented at the Community Awards Ceremony on the 18th of October. Um, WDC are also helping us to get our top 10 tips for lifestyle as leaflet out. Demand, and we're looking at ways that we can try to engage with lifestylers to think about environmental improvements on their blocks. And that's something that farmers have regularly brought up with us in the past, the fact that there's very little regulation capturing lifestyle blocks. But on some, um, you know, there's some probably some questionable activities going on. Um, another thing that we've been contemplating for quite some time is its role in the regional policy statement consultation. So we decided that if the Zone Committee does want to facilitate community engagement of some kind, then it will be more productive for us to do it in the second round of public consultation in October, November, and Waimakariri Irrigation have also indicated that they would be keen for that. So we wait with interest to see what the second round is going to look like. And I'll just hand over to Erin, who um, is going to speak to you about a PC7 matter. Good morning. So yes, with the recent decision to make Plan Change 7 operative as of the 1st of September, the Zone Committee is aware of the consent review policy, which is 8.4.38. And so we just wanted to raise it with the council and like to be kept informed on the approach that's going to be taken to this in the likely time frame. So that was all from me. Uh, kia ora. Th thank you both. Um, was there any... Uh, Questions or clarifications for them both? Well, I have a question. I was um, really interested in the lifestyle block booklet that's been done, and I can see that having a relevance to the zone committee in Cell and Why Horror. And so I'm not sure if this is a question for you, Caroline, and um, thanks for your work on all of this, but um, maybe for staff, whether that's something that's being Flag to the zone, other zone committees for whom it's relevant, and if we can use, if it, you know, is it, is it so bespoke that it's very specifically for Waimakariri, or could it be um, shared around other zones? Thank you. Kia ora. Through the chair, um, I was just checking to see if Caroline wanted to respond to that, but look, um, the, the committee have done a, a great job of. Uh, identifying uh, and setting up, a, I guess, a focus around lifestyle blocks, as, as Caroline touched on, and uh, that that um, top ten tips was was very much their development, uh, and and a lot of work's gone into that, from uh, including uh, other members as part of a working group that um, uh, are working and and focus on lifestyle blocks in the Waimakariri district. I think I can speak on behalf of Caroline, and feel free to add. 
um, that the, the committee would be very welcome to share that and, and have it utilised elsewhere. So, yeah, I think as, as you've noted, uh, the Selwyn Waihora zone could be one that could immediately use it. So, um, yeah, so it's I guess it's now being developed as a resource and available to be, be used. I don't know if Caroline wants to add anything. Thanks, Murray. Yeah, no, that's exactly true. And, and obviously Selwyn does have, um, similar to Waimakariri, a large number of lifestyle blocks. So the anyone in any part of New Zealand who could use it or benefit from it, it's there um, to be used. I guess we've just been trialling, um, you know, been thinking about how can we actually deliver this to lifestylers? How can we um, get them motivated to want to start thinking about these things? And um, I did hold a workshop recently called Catchment Group, and it was a bit disappointing that, you know, even with an established group like ours, we had the, the diehard members came along, but it was probably a bit of preaching to the converted. And so how do you actually motivate those lifestylers to want to come along and give you an hour and a half or two hours of their time to get the mindset and perhaps what for some of them will be a new way of looking at their block of land. Um, so yeah, that's a work in progress anyway. So just to comment on that, Caroline, that'd be really interesting if we perhaps take it to our zone and then maybe um, you know, share notes and share learning and see if we can do something and see if we get a, a different take up or, you know, if we get any good top tips that come from our sharing, then we can we can all learn together. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, Erin. It's uh, Yang Cramwell here, the chair. Uh, I must apologise. I missed your comment regarding EC7 and the question. Can you please repeat it again? Yeah, not a problem. So um, the Zone Committee is just aware of the consent review um, policy that's co that becomes operative in Plan Change 7. So we just wanted to be kept informed of how the council was going to approach that review process and the likely timeframes that they were going to do those in. Erin, it's Tim Davey here and i um, happy to answer that. Uh, certainly happy to keep you informed. Uh, we don't, we haven't anything right now to inform you of, but we will certainly keep you informed and thank you for that reminder and we'll just note that. So thank you. Yep, no, not a problem, Tim, thank you. Jordan, any other um, questions, clarification for the two presenters? Oh, comment? Uh, and I just want to um, thank Caroline as, as the chair particularly, but certainly the previous chair as well, um, who was Michael Blackwell. But the, and the work of the working groups uh, that, that have come in and established certainly the top 10 tips. I know there's been a heap of work around that, but also the environmental um, awards. And look, I've only come back to that zone committee in the last six or so probably eight months now actually, nine months. Um, so yeah, look, great work to you and uh, Caroline and Erin and the rest of um, the committee that have been involved in getting that. And I can certainly circulate um, the awards email to my fellow councillors here so they're all aware of that. But I would just like to acknowledge um, or tell Trico Caroline's comments, um, which she opened with around the passing of two of our zone committee members to um, all zone committee members are important, but these are, seem to be particularly important um, and, and very respected individuals in uh, Peter Williams and uh, Mike Blackwell. And I just really want to uh, put that on the council table here in this committee. I know a fellow councillor wants to speak to that as well, so thank you. Uh, kia ora, Councillor Mackay for that. Councillor Burns. Uh, kia ora. Um, yeah, very much so. Uh, I'd like to... Um, Congratulate you for the work that you've been doing. Uh, obviously, Waimakariri is very, uh, very close to me, uh, having been at Tuhaitara for a number of years. And of course, uh, that, and when I worked for Waimakariri District uh, Council, with the opportunity to meet both Claire and Michael. Um, and uh, as Councillor Kaya said, um, it's just important to uh, acknowledge not only them in the context of this committee, but all of the people uh, across the region who have been involved with these groups, which have been going now, you know, a decade, a decade or more, and uh, but in this case, uh, I think uh, Kia Fitu Rangitia Koi, 
um, in the context of this is return, take your place amongst the stars, along with your ancestors that are doing the sky. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Councillor Burns. Uh, just to reiterate those comments to you both, uh, Caroline and, and Erin, just for making time today to come online and talked about all the uh, the great work that the, the zone is doing in, in Waimakariri, but also uh, the, for the environmental awards. You know, so much uh, we probably don't praise uh, or acknowledge the good work, um, and by having those uh, biodiversity, um, the awards, the environmental awards, it kind of does bring the environmental um, mahi to the fore. So uh, just acknowledge the, the zone for putting that forward. So thank you both. Um, enjoy you after the rest of the rest of the day, and thanks for coming online, Noreda Tena Korua. Thank you. Um, oh, thank Murray's you. already left the table. So um, thanks, Murray, for helping. Um, so uh, the um, the uh, motion is on uh, page 24 uh, regarding the recommendations. Uh, they are be online. They are put up on screen. There they are. I'm not going to read them out. Um, so eight point two. Uh, can we have a got oh, a mover? Councillor Burns, seconder Councillor Mackay. Um, any discussion? No discussion. All those in favour, please say aye. Against none. Carried. Kilda. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, moving on to eight point three. Um, the fish screen working group um, final report. Um, can I please ask um, um, Mel? Um, Bring uh, Nathan to come to the table, please, and also bring your your cohort. Um, <laughs> I know Ross Ross Millichamp, he's the chair of the Fish Screen. We have uh, Mike Pickford, member of Fish and Fish Screen Working Group. Uh, also, we have um, oh, who else we've we got up there? Adrian, oh, Adrian, do you want to come up, or you got your right, uh, Dennis and Adrian? You both right back there. You're good. And online we have. Oh, there we go. Stephen's already got his screen on and got his uh, mic on. Kia ora, Stephen. Thanks for coming on. Marina. And of course, so we have Jude come to the table as well. Kia ora, Kia ora koto. Uh, Mel, no to wa, over to you. Kia ora, councillors and chair. Thank you. I'd just like to let Ross say a few words on behalf of the Fishery Working Group as um, Ross is the chair. Kia ora, everyone. Um, as Mel said, you're going to hear briefly from three of us today. Myself, who was the chair, you're going to hear from um, Mike from Niwa and Stephen from Irrigation New Zealand. Um, you've got a report in your council meeting papers that sort of summarises the end of the current working fish screen technical working group process. And I'm just going to speak briefly to, the, to how we got to that point and then talk briefly about the future. So, so this fish screen working group was the second one we had. Uh, Brian Jenkins, the former chair of former chief executive of Environment Canterbury, chaired one in the mid 2000s, and it got a lot of traction because when the chief executive chairs a committee, stuff gets done. <laughs> and um, the end result of that was the first NEWA report into fish screens, which was the first bit of really decent scientific, independent scientific report into fish screens, and basically. It, it borrowed most of the science from North America, from mostly trout and salmon, salmonid fisheries, because it was the only science that was available. We certainly recognised the need to cater for native fish, but no one had done any research at all on to how native fish interact with fish green facilities, so we didn't have any in there. Um, so that report then walked itself into um, your Schedule 2 of your land and water company rather plan which is now the rules which fish greens are consented under. Um, but to be fair, not much happened in the field after that. Basic case, great plan, not much happening in the, in the field. In, the mid, in about 2018, Irrigation New Zealand asked for the fish green technical working group to be reformed. Their members were saying it's really hard to build a compliant fish green um, with what we know now. So we got one of the real benefits of having an independent group was we we're able to get some funding from MPI to look into some technical stuff, which Mike will talk about, um, in relation to how to fill some of the information gaps about how fish interact with fish screens. Got to be upfront here, the native fish knowledge is still woeful. It's slightly better than it was, but I think Mike would acknowledge if you really want to get on top of native fish, there's more work needed to be done. And in a way, one of the good things about an independent 
technical group as we can, we were able to levy funds that perhaps it would be harder for ECAN to levy as a council organisation. Um, so Michael talked to his report, but basically one of the things we found was that engineers are rubbish, are rubbish at designing fish screens, and that's not a criticism of engineers. Basically, engineers and biologists need to be involved together right at the start. If a biologist tries to apply their information or their knowledge once the location and the screen design is underway, it's almost impossible to retreat to come back from that. So we're lobbying for you know getting biologists and engineers working collaboratively collaboratively together right at the get-go. And that's one of the faults I think we've identified up till now. Um, one of the really good things about the Fish Green Working Group is it has it's got all of the parties who could potentially be lobbying and complaining and going public. It's kept them busy on a process. But now that that process is coming to an end, there is a risk that those people, because I hate to say it, but the process is identified a heap of information gaps and has probably identified that the infrastructure out there is actually worse than people might have thought. Um, we really don't want those lobby groups going off and losing sort of focus on coming up with a solution. We'd love to keep them working towards a solution. Um, the other slight difference in the second round of the, the second NEWA report was we had a little bit more national context. We had buy-in, particularly buy-in from Otago, Regional Council, and we really think for this to work, it has to be more than just Canterbury. Because Canterbury, admittedly, most of the water is taken here, but but volume of water isn't the only thing. You can get a bit sort of hoodwinked by litres or cumex versus number of takes, and so we'd love to see the the process rolled out a bit more nationally. And I don't know that ECAN alone can do that. And, and finally, the, the final thing we found is it's really hard to build a compliant fish screen. This isn't just a matter of farmers not being prepared to spend the money. It's not. It's, it's often, in many cases, the farmers understand the need to improve their fish screens and are prepared to pay for it. But at the moment, we're really struggling to tell them um, what they should build, especially in some locations. Our alpine rivers are particularly volatile and nasty places to build expensive infrastructure. And we, we 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 certainly in the time that I've been involved in this recent fish screen working group, we've made quite a lot of progress. We have now got a few compliant fish screens, um, but man, there's some work yet to be done. And and the final warning is that you're about to start or currently started a great heap of consent renewals around water, and it's the fish screens are going to be real. They're going to be really hard, but they're going to be one of the hardest elements of reconsenting an existing um, take because in some locations we simply don't know how to resolve it without moving a location or joining up takes into shared facilities and things. So um, there's a lot of work coming and um, we don't know all the answers and we'd love to continue the work. So that, that's a summary from me and um, I guess we'll pass over to Mike. Morning. Um, I believe you you all seen a copy of that. I, I appreciate it. it's a large document, the the guidance document that we produced at the end of the um, the fish screen working groups um, tenure. And um, so what I wanted to do today was just a quick summary of that, um, just to step you through some of the the high points and highlights. So um, very simply, screens at, at water intake facilities ensure that fish um, aren't damaged um, or removed from the rivers that they're already in. New Zealand's got a relatively unique problem here because most of our native freshwater fish are, are, um, are migratory and small. So um, species like whitebait um, are likely to encounter a fish screen or a water intake at multiple times during their life history. They'll encounter it as they go out to sea as small larvae, larvae and they'll encounter it again when they come back in from the sea um, as a whitebait or a, as a juvenile fish. So they are more likely to interact with um, a fish screening facility of which the fish screen part is, is only but a part. Um, most of our freshwater fish species are poor swimmers um, and bottom dwellers. They survive in our very steep and fast flowing streams by sheltering amongst the stones on the bottom. And so many of the early fish screens that we adapted and adopted here in New Zealand were developed overseas, particularly in North America, for salmonids, for trout and for salmon that um, are 
fish that spend most of their life in the middle of the water column, but they are strong swimmers. So we have native fish that are very different to that. They live on the bottom and they are not particularly strong swimmers. And they have behavioural nuances, which means they're much more likely to encounter and to um, interact with the fish screen. So it's, it's not a hard to um, stop the fish going into a water intake. It's just a filter that we put over a pipe. The problem is um, it's much harder to design a fish screening facility that can extract a large volume of water um, and, and screen it in such a way that it doesn't trap fish against the screen um, and that it can do this across a range of fish sizes, a range of fish species, and of course across a range of flows in the waterway that it's extracting water from. Um, so one of the key messages that came out of the report is that any screen and any fish screen facility has to be site specific. It is designed for the particular waterway, the particular take that is occurring there, and the particular suite of fish species that are moving past at the times of year that the water take is operating. So um, the Fish Screen Working Group developed um, some good practice guidelines to help with this design and help people that are designing and, and applying for consent. Um, there are eight criteria, which I'll just quickly go over, which was basically to do with the location of the screen, um, the gap openings in the fish screen, and, and broadly that is not only just the mesh size, but also the various main parts of the screen, the, the joins, the gaps, the, the bits that um, need to keep fish out of the intake. Um, through screen velocity in terms of how the water is approaching the screen, um, sweep velocity to make sure that most fish are swept away from the screen before having any interaction with the physical part of the screen. Um, a fish bypass to make sure that the fish that are rejected by the fish screen then return back to the environment that they came from in the first instance, making sure that that bypass is connected in the right way so that the fish um, are not encountering further predation from other species that are waiting in that bypass ready to eat them as they, they come past. Um, ensuring good upstream fish passage past these bypasses, obviously a large volume of water moving past the screen and then going out through a bypass appears to a fish coming upstream as just a tributary coming in. So we need to make sure that any fish entering that bypass can also get back out of it. And also some guidance about the operations and maintenance of these fish screens so that they are truly effective throughout the year and throughout whatever take is being um, used. So it's not always possible to um, satisfy each and every one of those reports and the and um, strengthen other factors um, if some are weak. So the working group also defines and develops an online guidance tool um, to provide a very structured process to assist landowners and consultants to identify and select um, a preferred location and a, an appropriate fish screen type um, when they're looking to install and, and to give a, um, an applicant some confidence that what they were choosing was a a design that would be appropriate for their particular instance. So again, as Ross said, I just want to um, emphasise that there's still plenty of work to be done in this area. Um, our knowledge of native fish and native fish swimming behaviour is um, embarrassing at best in New Zealand. Um, so there's, and we may be able to use some of those behaviours um, to our advantage in the design of fish screens. Um, we have very little knowledge of the effects of turbulence, so large volumes of water flowing up against screens and through constricted areas reduces turbulence and pressure, and the effects of that on the survival of even small fish we have very little knowledge about. Um, we have limited knowledge of the timing and location of migrations um, beyond you know, our knowledge of the whitebait season. We really don't have a lot of detailed knowledge around the country about when fish are coming and going into our rivers. Um, we need to refine um, our guidance tool that we've developed to better incorporate some of the new knowledge around the characteristics of these developing and novel screen types. We need to um, engage and disseminate this information. It's all very well to have a beautiful report with a Niwa waterhead on it, watermark on it, but it's actually got to go somewhere and people need to find it. So we need to make sure that this information is available freely to people that are considering um, or need to update their um, takes. We need better industry training and upskilling to make sure that the consultants um, have the skills to design a good take. Um, and also we need to make sure that there is an opportunity for innovation and, um, and alternative designs to come through um, so that, and provide testing and advice on that. Thank you.
Kia ora. Oh, Mike, is um, Stephen, are you having a few comments? Yes. Okay. Uh, kia ora, Tato. Uh, yes, look, um, I want to acknowledge the efforts of the Fish Green Working Group uh, and the fact that it was a, a group of people that may not have ordinarily sat around the table comfortably. Uh, there were quite uh, some divergent views, but uh, I, I want to congratulate the Working Group on the outcome and the way they worked very constructively and collaboratively around the table to advance the collective thinking. Uh, Ross and Mike have correctly identified there are still gaps, and I think that would be a given uh, that we're looking at the interaction of highly, bio, you know, highly variable biological uh, systems interfacing with hard infrastructure. Uh, there will always be some variables that are hard to manage and determine there. But this report has, cons has really drawn on the collective knowledge uh, of Niwa and others contributing uh, to advance that knowledge. Um, the, the output uh, that's being referred to is available. It is hosted on the New uh, Irrigation New Zealand website. Uh, so it is uh, available to those looking for it. Um, and we are conscious that we need to make that uh, uh, readily uh, searchable for those looking for it um, and along with the final report there's a substantial list of all the background materials and uh, preliminary research and even videos uh, that came out of this trial work so there's a huge body of knowledge that is searchable and accessible uh, and I guess the the opportunity now is to build on all of that good work um, and uh, Irrigation New Zealand certainly supports an alternative advisory group approach uh, in terms of the what comes next. Um, and for that group to be focused on using that advanced knowledge and the tools that were developed um, and working with the likes of ECAN and, uh, as correctly pointed out, other regional councils on a national basis to implement that good knowledge through a consistent design, consenting and construction process, um, while recognising that there are still some knowledge gaps. And uh, the, the function of any future group may also uh, need to consider how knowledge gaps are addressed um, through additional project work. Uh, but look, that's uh, what I wanted to contribute and uh, primarily to congratulate the Fisk Green Working Group on the progress to date. Good, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Mel, is there anything else? Uh, thanks, Chair. Kia ora, councillors, again. I'd just like us to have a couple of additional points in, in addition to what Ross and the Fisk Green Working Group members have said. Uh, so basically, although the Fisk Green Working Group has identified the need for further work, this work would be done by a, a new technical advisory group, but this new technical advisory group will also need to consider the uh, membership of Mana Whenua representatives, which is currently missing from the existing Fishbreen Working Group, and feedback from members and the results of the review from Environment Canterbury support such a technical working group being formed, but only but realizing that it can only be effective if it has a clear role and purpose to support a resourced uh, program at work at Environment Canterbury. And councillors will note that in the paper, we've added in the recommendation to um, for staff to assess the requirements of a fish green program, including the role of an external advisory group. However, prior to forming a new technical working group, we're coming to you councillors uh, to request the current fish green working group be discharged. Um, and as the regional committee is not meeting, the decision to discharge the fishing working group is being sought from you as the land water and land committee. Thank you. Well, Judith, anything? No. Couple. Uh, open up for uh, questions, discussions, clarification. Uh, Council Korako and Council Burns. Um, Tēnā koto. Just um, the highlighting the fact about the mana whenua representative so what when did that process start so the current process started in 2018 and we've had intermittent involvement from um what was the name of the chat from that sorry yeah it's okay 
had children. Anyway, we've had we've had intermittent. It's not been sorry, Matt. Thank you. Um, and we had um, we've had other people come and go, but um, to be and we certainly had a standing invitation. But to be fair, the the point at which we start rolling out the science into the field is the real point where local iwi contribution is going to be really important. Up until now, it has largely been Niwa doing stuff in fish tanks in a, in a laboratory. Um, the Arafenua people were involved in the, in the um, we had a, we were involved in attempting to build a compliant fish screen on the Awapino and they got heavily involved in that. Mind, that's my understanding. But no, certainly that's a weak point of the current group and we'd love to We'd love a new group to embrace that better. Uh, a supplementary question. Um, so this has been this 2018, and I see point four that you've actually identified. But I mean, are you aware of the different faces of Naitohu? Because you're actually um, quoting in here to do Nango Naitohu, and then um, Nga Papatuhu. So are you at a point now? Because um, you know, this when you look at the Naitahu Rohe with 18 Papa Tupuruna, um, and each one has their own a uh, quite individual. So what are you actually looking for? Are you looking for someone to represent the collective? Or are you looking for um someone a, a runanga that could actually lead it, which would be very difficult? Um, yeah, I just I got to get some kind of sense because what you're saying is that you haven't got uh, mana whenua representation. You aspire to have that, but what do you want? To the chair, we haven't got that far. When we had the workshop, um, so we ran a technical working workshop to request information. Um, in terms of what a new technical group would look like and we invited um we went through the prompt process so we invited mana whenua representatives to come from all of the papatipurunanga and inform tront and worked with the tuia team in terms of setting up that process there will be a similar process that will run when we look for new people yeah. sure, thanks mr chair um I must admit, as I was listening to you all talking, thank you very much. It's uh, very good, uh, including the briefing we had earlier on um, in the month. Um, my questions relate to, uh, as you were going through, I almost thought this needed a, um, a a bit of a change in terms of reference rather than starting another group, given the fact that you have identified so many things that uh, occurred. Having said that, uh, I thought it was wrapped up very nicely at the end there, and thank you very much for that. Um, what sort of time frame are we looking at for this, given that, um, especially Ross, when you highlighted the fact that idle's hands are the devil, I'm putting words into your mouth, of course, uh, idle, idle hands are the devil's work. Uh, clearly, we some, some sort of momentum has been gained. Um, some really good stuff has come out of it. But you've also identified the fact that we do need to progress and ensure that this is not all lost. So, so one of the... Thank you. One of the reasons behind discharging the group is I, I personally as chair think that we've expended most people's goodwill. We have had a whole lot of people, you've got a NIWA report done for nothing, which never happened in my lifetime before, no disrespect, Mike. Um, we, we, we've had, we've got quite a big group and there's a whole lot of people on it who I think have, we've probably asked enough of. So one of the recommendations that we've given um, to Judith and her team is that if you're going to form a new group, you do need to resource it because you can't keep relying on. But I think we're starting to run out of that that um, contribution. We're also at the point now where we've acknowledged that the rules in your plan, Schedule Two of some plans, names I've forgotten, are close enough to being good enough. Um, we need to start rolling out and doing stuff in the field. And I think that that sort of rollout is a different process than where we've been to date. And that's why we, we think we probably need a refresh. Basically, the group was formed. Andrew Curtis of Irrigation New Zealand rang people in you and invited them to a meeting. And that's as loose as it was. And I think if we're going to get into the nitty gritty of sort of starting to influence consents and 
things like that. We probably need to have a more formal appointment process and have a wee bit more rigour around who's on it, basically. <laughs> Thank you very much, all three of you, for that presentation um, around this. I, I just want to sort of build on the two last questions, and I'm not sure who's going to answer this. Um, we've, he we've heard that there is a national need for uh, appropriate fish screens, um, and presumably a national need for this some sort of uh, further technical look at this. And then we've got a re recommendation in our papers um, on point three, which obviously staff are looking at assessing the opportunities and needs specific um, to a Canterbury framework. I'm just wondering whether, um, possibly a little bit unfair, but whether <laughs> any, any of our speakers that have come in would like to posit what that future group might look like? Is is it a, an overarching group with a national view and then um, specific area, uh, you know, sort of a sub, sub group? And particularly when I'm thinking about, and well, you um, alluded to it, is around the mana whenua representation and how that might work. And, and that was follow up from Council um, Kalako's question here. So is that a fair question through you, Mr Chair? <laughs> Okay. Yep. Uh, kia ora. Um, look, I just wanted to touch on, um, you know, the Ross and Co highlighted some really interesting opportunities and challenges, but they are also opportunities for us to how do we progress the mahi that's been achieved to date. There is a real tension here about Canterbury needs, but also a national need. And I know that there is the question of how much does the Canterbury ratepayer pay for something that's actually a benefit across New Zealand. And one of the things we did earlier um, about 12 months ago was engage across other regional councils to get a sense check of where they're at with their um, level of attention on the need for effective fish screens. You know, some of them are just, it's not something they're looking at and others are actually really interested. So there's that question of balance of, what do we do in Canterbury, but who else benefits? And Otago and Southland in particular were interested in the work we were doing. Um, so we've just got that tension between national and local. We've also got the question of to be successful, we need to resource it appropriately. I think you highlighted well the we're on the goodwill here. So that's part of coming as we look at the environmental regulation and protection service delivery model to inform the LTP of building what does resourcing look like. But just to be resourced, but not have clarity about how the programs of the role fits in and what's expected, it needs to be partnered with that. And that's the piece that the staff are looking at, recognising there's you know, a future plan, um, there's current consent. And I just wanted to highlight one thing, which is the work we're currently doing, both consenting and compliance around fish screens when they come up, the staff need to reach out for technical advice. They do that. Okay, so that isn't reliant on this group. This group was about doing something more collaborative and more, if you like. So that's the bit we're working through. I think we can loop back um, in, a, in, a, in a couple of months around uh, where we're getting to, but it wouldn't, um, if that's useful, either through the LTP discussions or through this committee, um, as far as are, are coming. But there's those several things to balance here that we need to work at. I just posed the question to you then, do you think um, a, a kind of a national strategy is too big a bite? And would you actually think about um, centering uh, your initial kind of pilot uh, in a very progressive um, region like uh, Canterbury with very understanding 10 Papatipa Runanga, all of that? I don't know. That's my question. I think that the, the, the problems in Canterbury um, probably encompass most of the other problems around the countryside. So I don't think that um, we have too many unique problems outside of Canterbury which aren't dealt with in Canterbury. Um, likewise with uh, um, Manfino, I, I feel 
um, that you know the challenges of that um, in the workplace in Canterbury are probably representative of, of what we run around, around the countryside as well. So I don't think there's a, there's a problem with taking a lead in Canterbury and applying that nationally. Um, as we said, there's, there's always a nuance with any individual um, application of this, which is going to come down to the individual river or the individual tributary of any sort of catchment. Um, so I don't think any sort of national guidance is ever going to get down to that level. But I think we uh, have the position, the, the capability to develop policy which would be uh, applicable across uh, guidance and be applicable across the whole country. Sure, Mike, thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Ward, is your question similar to this or follow on from this, or is it different? Otherwise, I'll go to Councillor Burns just for a supplementary question. Okay, I'll let you go. Yep. Yeah, firstly, I'd like to congratulate you on your report. And I mean, I do echo the fact that this could be rolled out nationally. I mean, I'm having been an irrigator for far too long. I know, you know lots of streams and rivers do have different characteristics and different, different issues. And um, just one question, I in the past have been, our screens on our farm have been audited. Is that, is that process still being done or has that ceased? What's happening now? So there is, there is still the ongoing monitoring of fish screens on for water tanks. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I'll just go back a bit. Um, given the, the National uh, versus Canterbury um, and the relationship through Canterbury, uh, Narunanga with one iwi, uh, and also the fact that I, I think it's twice the number of consents than every other regional council combined, is that the right figure? Would that not then say that a regional perspective, uh, uh, given also that uh, uh, what Mike has just uh, re um, brought up, would that not be grounds enough for taking it on as a regional? Uh, it's kind of a weird question. You, I know I've put you in a difficult position to go, yeah, yeah, great, we'll do it. But I guess, I guess that's why we're in this position. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, the issue for the Canterbury experiences with both the environments we have, the number of takes, the size of takes, you know, the Rangitata versus your Oh Happy Spring, that reflects that diversity. And it is the reason why Environment Canterbury stepped into the challenge right back with, you know, the previous CEO, Brian Jenkins, around we need a solution. And we know some of those outcomes, we have to work with the industry sector that are involved in providing technical advice to consent holders, et cetera. And, you know, it's, and the realisation of just an engineer and putting metalwork on the end of the pipe isn't enough. The pairing that with the understanding of fish biology and movement is really important. And that, you know, that's not a skill set you find easily. So there's been this real challenge to come through. And I think that's exactly why ECAN is at the front edge of this as the regional council holding the space. And that's why I reached out to the colleagues, because I'm also going, well, if you're going to get benefit out of this at other regional councils, what's the opportunity to work together um, if they're going to, you know, get benefit as well for their communities and their hours? Sure, Judith. Thank you. For, thank you for that. Um, Stephen, I see your hand up. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I think Judith might have actually summarised what I was about to say. Um, as, as a national body, Irrigation New Zealand certainly uh, sees the opportunity for applying this uh, knowledge nationally. Uh, there were, of course, other organisations part of that Fish Green Working Group who are also national bodies and, and representative of interests uh, across uh, a number of our rivers and the different uh, morphologies that those take. Um, and this is certainly something that uh, our organisation raises in Wellington. I'm speaking to you from Wellington today uh, when we're interacting with the likes of Ministry for Environment and Ministry for Primary Industries and MB and any one of the other government agencies that has, uh, has a hand in freshwater management and biodiversity protection. So, uh, but... <laughs> Uh, it, it's it's almost a careful what you wish for. Uh, some of those things move incredibly slow. Uh, I think the opportunity is that Canterbury does have uh, by far the majority of fish greens compared to the total number nationally. Um, and so is uh, Canterbury certainly leading the pack in terms of, of knowledge and, and issues here. Uh, 
the the information is already freely available nationally um, uh, through our through our organisation. Um, but turning this into uh, turning any future advisory group into a national based body, I'm just not entirely sure where that would sit or how it would be funded. Uh, it could be quite complex to actually achieve that uh, objective. Um, thanks for that, uh, Stephen. Yeah, it's uh, yeah that national con uh, idea and issues. You've just kind of raised some of the bigger issues for that, but uh, it is a, I suppose it is an option and one thing that we can, you know, uh, through Judith can, you know, and, and the team look look forward to. You know, what, what are those possibilities? But one thing that um, uh, Mikey talked about the um, lack of knowledge regarding our, regarding our native fish. But one one of the things is. Uh, and it's site site specific, which you mentioned, but also Mataranga Māori and how you know uh, using that knowledge to to uh, know the behaviours of you know migration and um, recruitment and those kind of things. So, um, but really acknowledge this the work of of the of the uh, of the committee of the of coming to the fish screen um, group. Just uh, you know, and to you, Ross, I know your passion about about this mahi, um, and you, yeah, this is you're on the second iteration, so. Like to acknowledge you and also the whole the whole um, um, the whole team. As you said, there was a lot of uh, Stephen said a lot of group you know different people coming together and 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 through their collaboration and working together managed to actually come out with some good outcomes. So uh, even though this this I suppose as one door closes, another one will open. Um, and on that note, I'll hand over to Vicky, Councillor Southwood. Yeah, and thanks, Ross. I remember being baptised on the regional committee when this working group. First kicked off seems like a lifetime ago. It seems like so long ago. So great, fantastic for all of you that you've had this sticking power and you've just kept on. You must have just kept on pushing away. What I'm really um, interested in, my question is around the recommendations. There's, I would really like to know there's some sort of timeline or some point at which we can expect to report back or the, you know, when is this? Um, when do we expect a, a group to be appointed, be it for a national pro type project or sticking with Canterbury, um, just to make sure it doesn't sort of lose that traction? Um, I think that's really important. So I don't know if staff have got a recommendation or some, some tweak they can make to be more clear. Look, because we need to inform this work around the resourcing requirement, right, as part of the work we're doing, and forming the three core services, and this one clearly falls under that environmental protection and regulation core service. Um, I think we can we can commit to give an update in in about three months, so before, towards the end of the year, about where things are at. Now, whether that's we've got to the point there to say yes, there's a committee and it will start this date. I don't know. We need to do that work, and I mean, I'll. The intent is to keep these guys informed about that piece of work as well. We made that commitment at the workshop we held that um, because they're really keen to make sure we've got that momentum just like and hold us to account just like like you do as well. So um, I think that's the best I can do at this stage about an update on progress and what it's looking like. Yeah. But I think we have a late November Water and Land Committee meeting. Um, so that could be what we aim for. That would be three months. Judith, this, this um, also process of work moving forward, we um, kind of built into the LT, into LTP uh, and financing this, those kind of issues as well. Yes, yeah, so if we wanted to, if we got to a point where we decided we wanted it, we resolved, we'll have to build in the what will it cost <laughs> as part of the LTP discussions that will then be out for um, consultation and so it'll be the it's essentially priming the finances up for the next financial year. I guess the other question we've got is I just wanted to do highlight again that if in the meantime we've got technical questions, staff will be reaching out and securing those and we'll keep the guys informed around that progress. Supplementary, Councillor Southwood. Well, just because this is something that will feed into the long term plan again, should there be something so great? Yes, it would be good to maybe note that it come back in the November Land and Water Committee. Um, but I just wonder if it should also be something that identifies that it's it's work in progress to be that the funding required will be brought to us to to consider in the long term plan budget. So again it's you know it gives a timeline. 
yeah but it's it's the recommendation part i think that which is some a sort of recurring theme that we're having around our table at the moment but making sure it's actually pinpointed and that we can keep it on our radar and not sort of let it drop away yeah council southwest as as the, it'll be part of recommendation three it'll be in our status report um so it'll come up in november and as um judith already mentioned that it will we'll get a supplementary discussion on for the november meeting so it'll show up that status report and be an ongoing process. Uh, Councillor Kōrāko. Maybe this is too leading a question, but ballpark, how much? I've both. Just go back one step. Um, whether you fund an external group. If you don't fund an external group, you're going to have to increase your internal capacity. That's what we got to. We didn't look at numbers, but basically you've got a big number of consents about to start arriving. No easy answer to how to resolve it. Um, and at the moment, our understanding is you had one chap who used to do the stuff and he's left and you're down to none, I believe. I might be unkind, but um, I don't know what numbers are involved, but there's a lot of work. The lesson from the last working group is the last working group because people like Fish and Game and Doc, they've already been paid salaries. They they could participate effectively free of charge. Um, one of the reasons we didn't get Mana Federal involved is because it's unreasonable to ask for assistance if you can't pay for it and we didn't have a budget. So that, that's one element of it that we that whether it's done by an external group or whether it's done internally, it's going to cost some money. I don't know how much money is involved, but inherently unfortunately it's going to be. Um, the bottom line, because you can go along that thing, you know, money talks and the rest of it, you know what? Okay. So it was just a question because at the end of the day, we do all this thinking, we do all this, all these papers, we do all this, but then it's actually about the bottom line in the end. Okay. Sorry. Have you finished? One or two? No. Oh, bye. Uh, any any other questions? Otherwise, we'll finish. We'll finish there. Nothing else. We'll ask um, um, Mel, Judith, and the team to may step away from the table. Thank you for your time. Oh, and just just before, sorry, I didn't finish before. As I said, you know, as one door closes, another one opens. So there's always opportunities. And just once again, Ross, for your for your um, for your dedication and mahi for this. Thank you, and for the team, Gilda. Thanks. I could just say one more thing. Mel's held our group together because she's. You guys have funded her involvement in our group, and honestly, if she didn't bring me up and hassle me and everybody else, we would have got nowhere. So it's. It actually has been a really significant contribution he can have made to keep the group going. So. Thank you, Ross. Jordan. Um there, the motion there is on the screen uh, for the motion and the opportunity for discussion. Uh, it's on page 41, if you're not too sure, that the uh, Wood and Land Committee uh, received uh, an update, which we have from the, from the CWMS and the F SWG recent works charge, the Fish Screen Working Group, and uh, number three, request environment and staff. This is the opportunities and needs associated with a program of work relating to fish screen facilities, uh, including the opportunities of the contribution of an external group. Uh, is there a mover? Uh, Council of Ward, seconder. Council of Southworth. I was going to ask, do we need to incorporate into that that the, there will be a report back in November at the November Water and Land Committee in that? So, yeah. So I'm just, I can't remember, remember quite the process here. So I can't second it, can I? I'll have it second. So I would like to suggest, based on the information we had at the table, that we extend with that magic word that just popped up there. Uh, and provide an update to it. Yes, perfect. Move an amendment. So I'd like to move that amendment. Thank you. Maybe, maybe copy, copy number three. Oh, what do I do? Do I move that moment? Yeah, I'm I'll moving see that. that. I'll see. I'll see. Yeah.
I think I've already said, I mean, I'd just like to see some specific date and specific action and the time attached to that. So it just that just rounds that off for me. Thank you. Oh, it wasn't on mic either. So I'm not going to do it again. Right. Um, done. Gary, type Y, moving on. 8.4. Oh. No, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, request that is it possible to change the order of the agenda to bring up now or to Fariko? Uh, because I, I need to leave. Ah, oh, you've got. You're waiting on officials. Is that, is that, is that what it's about? Okay, I should have done it earlier. Okay, never mind. Yeah, this could we could just fly through this one. Okay, cool. No, okay, we looks like we can. This one will. Uh, just the. Yeah. Is that okay to do that? Just adjourn for a minute. I'll come back to it. it. It seems that this next paper is not going to actually be that long, hopefully. So I'll just rest on the fact that that, that because the next one after this paper is all too far to Well, yeah. just don't know where I'm going. Uh, through the standing orders, we can um, move 8.5 up if if we need it, but we just we've got all the staff here for 8.5. Okay. When that uh, yeah, it withdraw, I'm withdrawing now. Seeing that uh, my Tiatiawa colleague has reminded me about my responsibility. Okay, I'm withdrawing it. Let's stay with the status quo. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, Councillor Korako. For that, we'll stay with status quo and go to 8.4. 8.4, just the discharging of the CWMS Regional Committee. Can I please ask um, Dan to the to the table, please? And Cam. And Cam, I'll open to you for the staff um, recommendation. Then I koto, um, councillors. Um, so just um, this paper is um, concerning the discharging of the Canary Water Management Strategy Regional Committee. Um, and just before I pass over to um, Dan to give an intro to the paper, I just wanted to highlight some um, staff recommendations to amend the recommendations as you see them in your paper today um, and that you see on the board at the moment. Um, just to ensure we get process right, um, we are suggesting amendment to number one. Uh, so it's recommends to the Canary Regional Council um, that the um, the, the regional committee is discharged as a committee of the council. That's just because that decision needs to go to the, the council proper rather than the um, water and land committee. Um, and the second um, proposal there is to acknowledge the mahi of the members of the Canary Water Management Strategy Regional Committee and thanks them for their dedication. And would you would you like a, a thank or a thanks? Sorry, that's me. Just ignore it. Just ignore it. Acknowledges and thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Cam. I'll uh, hand over to um, to Dan. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, the the CWMS Regional Committee was has been part of the CWMS since uh, about two thousand and ten, and it is a a committee of the Regional Council, um, and it hasn't really met formally since twenty twenty one. Um, due to an inc incomplete membership and um, over the past decade it has provided um, support for staff to report uh, independently on the Canterbury Water Management Strategy targets and provide advice on some of the areas of work that we were undertaking. Um, to a certain degree um, the the principles and priorities of the CWS have been eclipsed a little bit by the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, which has meant we've had to really look at um, some of the institutional structures that, that go towards supporting discussions on the CWMS and on freshwater management. Um, and in, in, that, in that way, and in, in, in the way the policy is sort of framed, um, it's meant we're kind of having to take a look at uh, how we have those discussions with our community and the degree to which we can continue to have a regional committee represent that. So um, 
in response to the changes that are happening nationally uh, in, in the freshwater management policy and with the challenges of, of formulating a, a committee that could represent those um, discussions locally, we decided to um, recommend a, um, a discharging of the regional committee. We, we have already reconfigured this committee in 2021 to um, move from, I guess, a decade of, um, of having uh, discussions about the values of water and what we should do around freshwater towards more around um, focusing on implementation uh, and, and still maintaining around on the terms of reference for the regional committee, a focus on providing advice and um, keeping an independent view on those targets. Uh, as part of that, we looked to, to reshape the membership. Um, we went from some 32 members down to about seven or eight and um, with a focus on including mana whenua membership as well. Um, so, um, as I said, the national policy statement has, to some regard, in some regards, eclipsed some of the principles and priorities of the CWMS. And we are working at the moment on a regional policy statement with Mana Whenua as well. So, to some extent, the having a regional committee with um, that level of representation and a, um, a a group that's also governing the regional policy statement was kind of duplication. Um, and so, in this context, we've decided that it's best to um, to recommend a, a discharge of the regional committee for the moment. At the same time, we have gone to the Merrill Forum <coughs> around um, uh, the future for the CWMS and um, and have recommended that we do uh, take a look at the zone committees and the way in which the CWMS governs freshwater management in Canterbury. Uh, and we're looking to um, undertake a, a, a look at that by uh, the end of 2025. Uh, kia ora, Dan. Th thank you for that. Any uh, any questions for clarification? Councillor Davies. In terms of the, the staff, um, Amendment today, wouldn't it have just been better to come straight to the regional council for this? Uh, and through you, Chair. Um, yes, and, and so we didn't get that quite right, and so apologies for that. Um, however, I would note the Water and Land Committee does have a, a focus on water, so it is, um, in, as you've heard from the CWMS um, zone committees today, um, so it is a useful conversation to have here as well. Did I just hear you right in saying that you're not going to start looking at the structure of the zone committees until 2025? Because I was under the understanding that we were going to start looking at that sooner. Uh, and through you, Chair, yes, um, concluding in 2025. Um, so, we, so we've had the initial conversation with the Mural Forum um, this past Friday, in which the Chair took the conversation. Um, and there was, and um, I, I understand that it was well supported by the Mural Forum. Um, it's just the process will include kind of a discussion with all of our TAs, communities, mana whenua, and it will start this year, including in 2025. No other questions? No, I'll put the, uh, the recommendations up on the screen. They are on page 56. Um, the recommendations are recommend to the Canterbury Regional Council that the CDMS Regional Committee is discharged as a committee of the council. Also, number two acknowledges the mahi of the members of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy Regional Committee and thanks them for their dedication. And while I'm there, I'd like, I'd like it noted uh, in, our, in our minutes that we acknowledge the the regional council and especially the, the, the members of that working group were Jane Dittmer, the chair, Andrew Dark, Angela Cushing, uh, Cam Henderson, Kevin Gallagher, Rima Herber, and Ross Millichamp um, for their for their work. Even though they never came together as a formal committee and, and met, they did um, four to five workshops um, and did you know spend two years as a as a, a committee um, debating and other issues, etc. But acknowledging their their mahi as it says on their uh, recommendation there. So I'd like that noted. Uh, so that's um, open there. Uh, can I have a mover. Uh, Councillor uh, Swig, seconder. Councillor Southworth, open for discussion. Any discussion? Councillor Southworth. I'd just like to say, you no, know, the regional committee, I, well, I was a member of it back in 2018, 2017, 2018. 
as was uh, former councillor Lan Farm. I think councillor Craig Pauling was also on the regional committee. Um, possibly some others. It's obviously been a bit of a, a kickstart for a few political careers, um, for better or for worse. Um, but it, you know, that's just a, such a dedicated, passionate group of people that really were determined to try to make these sort of environmental freshwater issues better and sort of you know provide that independent scrutiny that I think is actually really important and personally I'm quite disappointed that that when we reframed the and we set up the committee to back in 2021 that it hasn't really been able to get traction and and do as much as I think it had the potential to do and I know there were various reasons why that that's happened but um, you know, really acknowledge those those names you mentioned there, um, Councillor Cranwell, were, I think, have all been involved for pre-2021. You know, they've been long involvement over many years. And so, you know, really good hard work. And it's great that we can find community members who are passionate and um, keen and bring the areas of expertise with that real local knowledge, which is also really critical. So thank you. Kia ora, Councillor Southworth, thank you for that. Uh, so the motion there has been moved by Councillor Swig, second by Councillor Southworth, and there's another one. Oh, Councillor Edge. Yes, I just want to um, f follow on from Councillor Southworth and and uh, or congratulate the people who who we had appointed um, in 2021. Um, and it is a shame that um, they couldn't continue their work, but I absolutely understand that the staff suggesting that uh, quite a lot of the, the work that um, they would have been looking at uh, is embodied in the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. The one thing that's slightly different um, and not sure how we will handle that uh, is the regional issues of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy, but if that's up for review, then those things can come into play in terms of uh, keeping track of targets and what are the gaps in the targets, what are we not delivering on the targets and all those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, perhaps, perhaps um, some of them may be uh, uh, are involved at a later date for, for advice, but otherwise, thank you. Look, Councillor Edge, no more discussion? None? So the motion's there. Be moved and seconded. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? None. Gary Calder. Thank you for that. Moving on to 8.5, all to Whareikai, Ashburton Lakes Lessons Learnt Report. Can I please ask um, Cameron Smith and also Judith Ilgley to the table, please? Yeah, can I foreshadow um, uh, making uh, an amendment at a later date? Uh, um, this paper provides the committee with the Ministry for the Environment's Lessons Learnt Report uh, and summarises how we are working to improve outcomes in Watu Whareikai. Um, Watu Whareikai, Spread and Lakes are a network of high country wetlands and lakes of significant cultural value to Ngaitahu and the wider community. Uh, they are recognised as a statutory acknowledgement area in the Ngaitahu Settlement Act 1998 and provide habitat for a range of nationally significant species. Um, the Lessons Learned document was commissioned by the Minister for the Environment in September 2021 and delivered um, by the Ministry for the Environment in May of this year. Um, its scope was to look at how the regulatory system contributed to the declining health of Watu Karikai Lakes. Um, the report identifies both the role of um, system-wide issues, including the role of tenure review um, and the Resource Management Act, um, but also regional vul vulnerabilities, including provisions and tools within the land and water regional plan. Um, the report provides um, useful lessons as this council goes about developing a new regional policy statement and integrated plan, but also as the government develops more national tools, such as freshwater farm plans, and there's commentary in there on that. Um, the report sits alongside our ongoing work in Ōtu Whareikai, uh, which is focused on ensuring all landowners have the appropriate authorisations in place, um, which manage the adverse effects on the lakes. Um, our work with others is part of the Ōtu Whareikai Working Group to develop an integrated management plan for Ōtu Whareikai, and ongoing work with statutory agencies, um, and particularly Land Information New Zealand, um, to align work in the catchment. Um, I'd welcome any questions. Questions open for discussion? 
Councillor Edge. And just a, a question on page 60, um, item 6. Um, I wonder if you could explain what the term appropriate authorisations means. Um, through you, through you, Chair. Um, so by appropriate authorisations, we mean making sure that they have the appropriate resource um, consents in place, um, which is focused on um, farming land use consents, but also intensive winter grazing consents and making sure that those consents uh, appropriately manage effects on those lakes. Elementary, Councillor Edge, or uh, Councillor Korako? In up order. Um, so, uh, thank you for the, for the paper, um, which very much to me just kind of outlines um, a lot of information that we already know um, and kind of thank you for that but um, the next part of it and particularly um, you know around the next steps um, I am the reason why um, I'm sort of making this observation is that I think that the next steps don't go far enough and the reason for it is because um, we need to um, start talking about Utu Farikai being classified as an outstanding natural environment. Now, the reason for that is if we look at the history of this, and um, first of all, around the Naitahu uh, settlement claim, there was statutory acknowledgement about the, the mana and the modi, actually, um, of, this, of these uh, lakes within the Takiwa. Um, the other part of it is that there have been um, various uh, state of the Takiwa reports um, and then also um, what this paper is about uh, it's about actually um, you know the, the whole kind of um, report of lessons learned and if there is actually any lesson that's been learned here it's the fact that um, it seems that we're kind of dragging our feet um, that we need to actually start uh, sort of saying our next steps and we need to be clear and put a timeline on if we can. And I know that we have to dance to the tune of um, the Crown. And I know we know all around the various legislations, you know, that have actually um, kind of been detrimental to this in some ways, particularly from a local uh, government perspective. But what I'm saying here is that um, if I'm Mana Whenua and I am, um, but if I'm looking at this and looking at the next steps, I would just think that it's the same old. So what I'm, my observation is, is that these don't go far enough. And I'm just really interested uh, in, and it's already been um, foreshadowed by uh, Councillor Edge, that there would be an amendment actually to um, this I'm looking forward to that. So that's my for Kilda. Kilda. Thank you for the paper. Kilda, Councillor Korako, Councillor Burns. Kilda, um, thank you, Councillor Korako. You articulated my thoughts um, very closely. Um, I just have a question on it's sort of, I have to sort of give you a bit of a preempt on it. Um, when you look at the uh, lessons learned report, paragraph two on page four, which is number 72 in our report. Um, it talks about the state of the lakes and um, and the consequences of them uh, when they become eutrophic. Uh, I, my question is, are the next steps um, really going to see any short to medium term improvement rather than gathering more information about what the report really already tells us? So. Could you help me on that, please? Yes, our, our, our focus up and through you, Chair. Um, our focus on our work in the lakes has been about driving short and medium term change, given, um, as you as you quite rightly point out, the risks to the lakes. Um, 
and I, I, I was probably at a miss before when I didn't actually mention the work that has been going on with the landowners to change grazing practices up there because there has been significant effort both by our, our organisations but particularly the landowners to make those changes. Um, but we ultimately know that we need to have um, kind of certainty that the regulatory framework is, is can um, block in improvements and drive further improvements. And so that's why we are um, really kind of looking at those authorisations in place. Um, and it's a real focus of this um, organisation um, over the next uh, three to four months to be doing that. That's a quarter. Cool. Um, so, what what has also been identified and and is the fact is that it's not just the late. It's actually so it's almost kiutiki tai. Um, it's actually about the land, and that's what Mana Fenua actually uh, highlighted in that. Um, state of the Takiwa hui that we had is that there needs to be in munison actually whenua and, and the wai Māori. So what you're saying though is that with that that is happening. Is that right? Or is it are they just dealing with the lakes with the wide water? Um so the focus on having the correct authorizations in place deals with um, really focuses on the water quality Aligned policy outcomes sought in our planning framework. So that's very much a focus on water quality. The piece of work with the working group around an integrated catchment plan for those lakes is much broader than that. And it's actually been framed up around the um, cultural health assessment work that's been undertaken to how do we give mana back to O2 Whakakai? So it's broader than water quality, it's ecosystems, it's Mahingakai, it's all those aspects. So I just wanted to separate those two things out. One's a collective process and other agencies have a role to play in delivering aspects of that and we'll work through that and we're hoping to have a draft of that integrated plan by December um, for the mana to the next mana to mana hui. The other is very much about our regulatory framework and Environment Canterbury as a regulator looking and making sure we're giving effect to those outcomes identified in that in the for the water quality triggers for those lakes through those farming land use activities. So, which is actually the regulatory framework is the work that's actually going on presently. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that because you're damned if you do if you do and damned if you don't, aren't you? But we because everyone just thinks it's quite well not everyone I suppose, but um, so mana whenua, they think it's quite simple. Let's just do it all together. But as you say, it's got to be at certain kind of steps. Thank you. Do you want to Councillor Korako? Any, anyone, any other questions? Any other points of clarification? Councillor Edge? Anything else before we put the motions forward? Sure. Go for it. Oh, well, the motions come up, but you've got no other clarif points of clarification for CAM? Um, Judith or even Andrew? No? Just a pause. Hold on. That's a couple. Of, um, we'll we'll put, actually put the motions up and then um, ask Cam and Judith to move away from the table. Thank you. And then if there's points of clarification during um, the, the, the motions, we'll, we'll ask staff to come forward. Jordan, so at the moment, the uh, Substantial motion on 8.5 is on the board. Um, that we've pardon. Oh, okay, moved. Second. Um, any any discussion? Because you're the mover and the seconder. Uh, yeah, I'd like to just talk to this, and and this is a very difficult topic, um, and I know that it actually has been the focus of Environment Canterbury for many years. And, and I know that there is a, a community out there that isn't happy um, with where we've got to and wants things to happen a lot faster. But on the other hand, I do think there are actually communities that live up in that area too that we have to deal with. And it just um, behoves us to actually think about the fact that uh, these are working landscapes that we um, are dealing with as well. I'm very satisfied with the next steps as they're um, proposed and laid out in the paper 34, 35 and 36. I think there are a lot of players in here and I also just want to acknowledge the work that has been done by Environment Canterbury and staff from our point of view in getting the outcomes that we want 
to see in the area uh, within the frame, the regulatory framework that we can currently operate in. Um, also want to acknowledge um, the Otabarakai Working Group and, and the players in that and, and you know, the fact that um, we are looking to, as Judith said, put the mana back into the um, Otabarakai Lakes area. So look, I'm pretty happy with um, and very pleased to support that motion. That motion. Kia ora, Councillor Mackay. Councillor Koraku as a seconder. Any comments or you? Oh. Uh, kia ora. Um, it's open now, Councillor Edge. I'd like to propose an amendment. Two amendments. Um, first amendment would be um, item two there that we actually bring the next steps items 34, 35, and 36 uh, to be under uh, two so that it's very clear of what's being planned. And uh, a, a fifth amendment, um, which I'm proposing, and, and it reads like this. And I'll I'll give it to um, uh, Oliver uh, to type in a wee minute. Uh, investigate the consideration of assessing the impact of land use activity on the outstanding natural landscape values in accordance with the regional policy statement and with reference to the NPS Freshwater Management 2020 Appendix 1B, which is natural form and character. I just bring this up to you. Just adjourn for a, for a minute while we, we do that. I can, Tato, um, I'd like to move that we extend to one o'clock so we can finish the meeting in one go. Uh, I'll move that, have a seconder. Uh, Councillor Burns, any discussion? Anyone? All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? Carried. All right, we'll go to one o'clock. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, we're all adjourned. Uh, we'll back into it. Um, we can see on the screen uh, the amendments put forward by Councillor Edge, just confirming Councillor Edge, they are the amendment. You moved it. Was there a seconder? Councillor Sweets. Um, comments, Councillor Edge. Thanks, Chair. I'm proposing um, the amendment, the amendment 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. Um, this is bringing those uh, statements already forward. Um, my amendment in particular is item three. And I've, I've bought that because, in my view, the it is really sad to see the report from the Ministry for the Environment um, and, and the outline of all the um, missteps that re various regulatory bodies have made over the last 20 years to, that has resulted in uh, almost complete degradation of this environment, uh, changed the landscape, um, affected the lakes. Um, and, and so my amendment is by recognising and ensuring that the outstanding natural landscape qualities are assessed by the working group as part of their work, means that um, there is a broader there is a broader view of the values across the whole of the catchment. You know, we have the RMA Part Two, Section Six, matters of national importance. Section 6B says the protection, and this is what we have to, uh, national importance matter, the protection of outstanding natural features and landscapes from inappropriate subdivision use and development. Section 6C, the protection of areas of significant indigenous vegetation and significant habitats of indigenous fauna. That is what we were required to do when we formulated the regional policy statement. And in the regional policy statement, we have a chapter 12 called landscape. And in that, it gives the objectives for identifying and protection of outstanding natural features and landscapes. 
And the principal reasons are that the protection of outstanding natural features and landscapes from inappropriate subdivision use and development is a matter of Section 6B. The landscape is an integral, integral element of the environment and potential land use effects on land values require an integrated management response. Obviously, it's fairly clear that that integrated management response has not taken place. There are deficiencies in our land and water regional plan, and we recognise that. The land tenure process undertaken by the government also interfered with that particular process and failed to adequately, in my view, acknowledge the outstanding natural landscape values. We have in, in our appendix four of the regional policy statement, there's a description of what this landscape's all about. And it says under the evaluation, the core evaluation, apart from our whole lot of values that it considers, areas of exceptional natural science and high legibility aesthetic, tangata whenua, and shared and recognised and moderate to high historic values in the landscape. These are really important things. On page 75 of the MFE of, this, of, of our papers, um, you know, when it says the lakes are now partly eutrophic with elevated sediment and nutrient levels, algal growth and reduced clarity. None of the objectives in the land and water regional plan for trophic levels between 2017 and 2021 have been achieved and are failing to meet national bottom lines. And it says in the paragraph below, this decline coincides with an upsurge in pastoral farming from around 1990 to 2010, involving increases in cattle and deer numbers, fertilizer use, winter forage grazing, and vegetation change. That changes from shrubs and tussocks to shallow rooted pastures. So that is a change. We could have actually evaluated the level of that change simply by looking at the landscape and how things have changed. And we could have probably stopped it. Uh, we've, we've let it go on for far too long. Um, I, I, I think, so what I'm really asking for in that third um, recommendation is that this, there, is, there is some greater consideration of the values that were originally embodied in that, um, in that particular catchment. Um, the original assessment of this as an outstanding area was, was first mooted in 1993 as part of the first regional policy, uh, first regional landscape assessment. It was then reviewed in 2010 and adopted in our, our, our um, regional policy statement after that. Um, so it is really important. It is not just about um, um, water quality. It is about the impacts on something that is iconic in New Zealand. Our New Zealand high country is regarded as an amazing um, special places across the globe. And, and I think that if we actually took a broader view of the problems in that landscape, we might actually have better solutions. Anyway, yeah, that's, that's uh, my statement. Uh, kia ora, Councillor. It's just uh, one thing from staff. Um, that the start of the three, as it goes, instead of that, it becomes request. Yes, that's fine. Oh, right. Kia ora. Yeah, yeah Councillor Swiggs, happy with that, changing yeah. from that, to, and now you, as a seconder, you can um, have a comment. Okay, so I've got a question of the staff, and so I don't know the process about how to how to do this, and I should have probably asked what got some how to questions out of the way first. We, we can call staff to the table if you'd like. I mean, I do have a question for staff, if, it's, um, if the chair will allow it. It's just, this is, the, um, and it's only on recommend, the, um, sorry, the number three is, and noting that it is only requesting the investigation and to consider it, are there any unintended consequences given that? Or any that you can see? Kia ora, councillors. Um, thank you for your question, councillor Swiggs. Um, councillor Edge, I uh, almost should give up my my job. That was a very good rundown of of what's contained within the 
um, national direction and our own regional policy statement. I just thought it might be useful to go one step further from the regional policy statement down to the methods that are used within the district plan to manage the outstanding landscape. So you're entirely correct, Ashburton Lakes are an outstanding landscape. The regional policy statement also directs that um, the protection of outstanding landscapes is, um, for the most part, the re responsibility of the district council in terms of their land use controls over that. It's exceedingly fortunate that Ashburton District Council is a member of the working group, and so there are people that can respond to that um, request now on the working group to be able to manage um, any sort of changes around that outstanding landscape or any sort of um, um, changes in the regulatory framework around land use within that environment. So I don't see a particular concern from my side around the further exploration of that. And I think that I, I endorse the idea that's coming forward here around the integrated management of, of both the water quality around the Y and, and the landscape itself. Um, thank, thank you for the um, explanation there. And given that this is a, um, a request to investigate and consider, I'm fairly very, well, I'm fairly comfortable and very comfortable to um, second it. It just gives a bit more weight and a bit more um, direction for us to follow. Um, and I think it's given the very vague um, response from the minister that he gave us on this. I think it's wise to have some visibility of us sort of taking a bit more direction down this line. Got a Councillor Sweets, Councillor East. Um, thanks. Um, I'm just wondering really whether the um, recommendation three or motion three actually isn't already embodied in, in two. And, and secondly, um, I just would question really whether the working group already has terms of reference which they are uh, obliged to work with and whether in fact this request would fit with their current terms of reference. Um, and thirdly, I'd like the um, three motions to be put separately. Uh, just my um, uh, staff, Judith, is you the question regarding terms of reference, etc. Um, there's an opportunity in that the terms of reference for the O25 Arakai Working Group are currently in review. Um, as we look to deliver focused approach on an integrated catchment management plan for O2 Whareakau Lakes. So I think as far as the request to look into that, we can, um, that would have to be built in. Uh, Councillor Mackay. One of mine has been answered. Well, one of mine has been asked, which is around separation uh, of voting on those. Um, relevant amendments, please. Um, I think if we were going to put up the working group, who is the working group? Um, and I've heard that staff suggest it, but um, in my way, my reading of uh, the working group here and the role of what they do, particularly around 23 here, and that if um, in the paper, I, I sort of think this integrated planning process and our next steps and what they're doing is sort of covered. So I feel that three is a little unnecessary. Can I, um, uh, first of all, um, Andrew um, Parrish, uh, when you came to the table here, um, you actually diffused, I think, um, you know, some concern. Um, and particularly around uh, reading through from um, Councillor Sweeks' question, but um, and sort of addressing uh, what Councillor East was asking or saying is that um, when we come back to this paper, one of the things that um, you know I said that was clear is that it, I believe that there was not enough in here in the next steps, and 
what that has led to in some ways, and not just me, there were a number of other uh, of my colleagues actually that were saying that, what this does is that it really does enforce, um, you know, work moving forward so that there's no confusion, actually. It's kind of all right saying sort of, but what we wanted and what we've got here is um, a clear, uh, articulate, concise kind of um, pathway as to, you know, how we're going to do this. Now, the reason why I think this is really important, I go back to the Naitohu settlement and around the statutory acknowledgement of Otu Whareikai. Then I go actually to um, the 2010 acknowledgement about the fact that this, there is the disintegration of the Modi and the mana of this, and that was actually back then. And then we look at the state of the Takiwa pre the, the 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 state of the Takiwa report, and then lessons learned. So if we don't take all that into account, um, we're still sort of blown in the wind here. But now we've got something quite clear as to how we actually operate and how this thing moves forward. Whoever the working group is or whatever, um, that's another discussion. But at least there's a structure here and very clear implementation pathway. That's why I'm supporting um, these uh, amendments and particularly number three in the requests. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora. Um, there's just a few minor amendments to for Councillor Edge and Councillor Swigs to look at. First one is 2.2, .2, supporting the Otu Whareikai group and its ongoing mahi. Yeah, and the second one is on three, request the Otu Whareikai working group. That's just adding Otu Whareikai. Happy with that? Councillor Swigs, Councillor Edge, happy. Kapoi. Any other discussion on the amendments? No? Any chat? No, no. Just, just to say, for the benefit of of people, why I specifically mentioned the NPS Freshwater Appendix One B, natural form and character, um, because um, that actually describes um, the sorts of things that get considered within our own out, um, outstanding natural landscape process. So it is it is part of the legislation of the NPS, which is the important thing going forward for staff when they um, look at um, our high country lakes and things like that. Amendments on the table. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. Was it? Oh, sorry. Oh, you want to do them separate? I can't fight. Right. Um, the number will go through one. No, it's all the amendments. So, so one, number one, one and four. Okay. Sorry. Just um, in uh, just just a question there. So is it the chair's discretion on whether we do them collectively or individually? Yes. Just checking standing orders. Councillor Davies, do you know off the top of your head? The chairperson or any member can require a motion that has been expressed in parts to be decided part by part. So Councillor East has asked part by part, so therefore um, two point, we'll do 2.1. We're going to go through part by part, or do you want section two altogether and then three? A substantial, it's not part of the amendment. My understanding of um, standing orders is that you could um, save a lot of time by just putting the bit bit of the motion that's not going to be controversial first and then take an amendment on the piece that is as a secondary. 
So I doubt whether anyone would object to uh, point one of the resolution. So I'm saying we'll put that first and then do um, motion two, uh, resolution two, and then do resolution three. That's, I'll stand corrected if someone's got a better interpretation of standing orders. Uh, kia ora, Councillor Lee, thank you for that. Um, we could have done that if it had been uh, brought forward um, at, the, at the substantial motion, is that correct? Yes. It's for the substantial motion, but because this is the amendment, the only we can do the, the division, uh, the separation on the on the amendment. So we're going to do the amendment. So each amendment. So just, just to clarify then, point one is still in the amendment. And if a member objects to a specific part of the amendment, you're you're wanting to put the whole lot together. So when we go back to substantial motion, you'll have an opportunity to split it up there as well. Yeah. So therefore, um, two point one. Um, so each and. Councillor Edge and Councillor Squiggs have all moved and seconded these. Um, okay, putting that, all those in favour, 2.1, say aye. Against, done, carried. 2.2, .2, moved by Councillor Edge, moved by Councillor Squiggs. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Uh, 2.3, uh, moved by uh, Councillor Edge, seconded by Councillor Swiggs. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, done, carried. Kia ora. Uh, moving on to um, th Amendment 3, moved by Councillor Edge, seconded by Councillor Swiggs. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, so you want those um, acknowledged. Against Councillor Ward, Councillor Mackay, Councillor East. Uh, the motion is carried. So therefore, these motions move to become substantial motion, and they move by Councillor Mackay and Councillor Koraku. Discussion. Anything else on this, Councillor East? Is any anything? Therefore, I move all these motions together. Yeah, the mover and the seconder, uh, Councillor Mackay and Councillor Korako. Oh, yeah, sorry. Just to... All right. I know he's done it. He's just moving the. There we go. All right. Substantial motion on the table. Moved and seconded. All those in favour, please say aye. Against. Uh, we can't separate now, can we? Or not? Okay. Uh, noted, Councillor East. Gary. Golda. We have three minutes. Uh, moving on to 8.6. Uh, page 104 uh, is Nicole here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been waiting all day. Kia Nicole. Thank you. No pressure. Um, this is for the Portfolio Work Program, Water and Land. Kia ora, Nicole. You know, go to, this is the um, update on the Water and Land uh, report for quarter four. So that's to the end of June. 2023. The um, levels of service and key initiatives are attached to the back. For this um, financial year, we have 12 levels of service and 25 targets. The provisional results for the year show that all but one of the targets are achieved. Um, the one that's not achieved is 2.1b, so that's um, implementation of Matanga 
Māori monitoring program. Um, this is the final draft is developed, just delays getting it finalised have meant um, this target wasn't achieved. It's progressing now and within the um, notes we are looking to bring you further information on that um, before the year end. Highly like that the November committee. Um, other other notes uh, within that is is that the original um, soil conservation and regeneration program is now finished and we've got um, a new funding grant 1.9 million for a new block of four years work to continue there. This will allow the um, program to be expanded into the Wanakarevi district and um, maximise impact with additional measures such as on farm nurseries and farm erosion plans. Uh, given the tightness of time, do you want me to leave that there and then answer any questions? Questions, clarifications from the call? Councillor Southall. Really just um, in a few places in the the targets with the ticks and crosses, there's like reference to, for example, target 11.3, report on the delivery of 10 priority projects. Um, and then there's somewhere else, there's the um, Manafanawa, Manafanawa Magakai projects. At the very bottom, it talks about the zone initiatives. And I just wanted, is there somewhere we can go to see what are the 10 priority projects? What are, I mean, I've just realised I don't quite exactly know which ones they are and whether I should know perhaps, but is there somewhere on our website that, that highlights that, that we can link to those levels of service and, and go and see? Well, what does that look like? Um, some of the detail will be there within our reporting back, particularly um, under the, the links into the, the zone projects. Um, yeah, I don't think 100% of all project detail will be up there, but a fair bit is on that reporting, reporting back link. It would be helpful to have maybe have, I'm not, I'm not sure what, sorry, I'm not sure which links you mean. Um, sorry, Claire, what was? Okay, go back on it. So, yeah, it's splitting out between different parts. Okay, I'll have a look at that and then, yeah, just help maybe to pop them in the levels of service summary table another time with a link so you can sort of see rather than having to remember bits back and forth. Thanks. Councillor Seth, if you have a look and if there's anything else we can, well, you know, for the next one we can be able to look at that. Kia ora. Any other questions? Clarifications for Nicole? Comment? Oh, you can do it later if you want. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. You may leave the table. Uh, before I'd like to, um, uh, the recommendation is on page uh, is that right? 60. No, it's not 104. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> 104. Um, that the Water and Land Committee receives the work program report for the quarter 4 22 for the land and water portfolio. Do I have a mover? Councillor Mackay, seconder. Councillor Edge, uh, any comments, any discussion? Yeah, just like to make a comment with regards to the SCAR program and the, the um, funding that we've now got that takes the work into Waimakariri um, district. There is a podcast or blog, I'm not sure what, what he would actually call himself, Kiwi Farmer, he's global, <laughs> and he's just, he put a video up fairly recently um, of putting in poplar poles at his place, so that's Alistair Bird up at the Grange in the back of Oxford, so it's it's well worth actually looking at, at the podcast because um, I think he had 100 poles he must have got funding or grant for, and um, yeah, he lays out how he's done proper planting in the in the few, in the past and, and what, what he's doing now and how he's I don't know, I think he puts in twenty per day, but it's a real workout. So it's not <laughs> it's not something that's particularly easy. But um and he sings the praises of environment Canterbury and the advice he's received. So I just think it's probably if you've got ten minutes, just um, look them up. It's it's quite a good video. Councillor Mackay, no doubt you can send it around on email. Cool. Oh. Kia ora, no, me. 
Um, any other any other bits of discussion before we move them? A motion, Councillor Ed, do you got anything? No. All right. On that note, all those in favour, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Aye against. None carried. Kia ora. Kia ora whanau. Well, um, it's, uh, our next meeting is on October the 18th um, this year. Uh, well, um, ka tai te wā, ka whakakapi te hui nei. Uh, nei te mihi kia koutou. We'll just finish off with karakia. Thanks for everyone. Thanks for the staff. Uh, it was a good meeting today and uh, finished before lunch, which is um, which is good. Nā reira. Um, kia, kia koutou katoa. Nei te mihi tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Kei whakakapi te hui nei i tēnei wā. A kia tau, ka minaki taka ka mea karo ki ruku ki tēnā ki tēnā o tātou. Ko mahi atu hua makihi ki. Ka toitu kupu toitu mana toitu reo tūturu ki te whakamaua ki a tīna. Oh, me who yeah. Oh, yeah.